How's it going everybody? Ad Ricker here, and I've been flying drones in the United States for over three years. And although that may not seem like a lot of time to some people, it's been enough for me to make a ton of videos on the subject, make a lot of friends around the country, and even create a small business out of it. The experience has been amazing. And that's why I feel passionately about this uh, new proposed rulemaking for remote ID for unmanned aerial systems proposed by the FAA late December. It's a topic that you might have seen a bunch of other people on YouTube um, talk about anyone from Flight Path to Remote Pilot 101, 51 Drones, Original Dobo, Ken Heron, Joshua Bardwell, and a bunch of other people that have done a lot of that early critical analysis of this notice of propo proposed rulemaking to give us a heads up and a fair warning about what the FAA is trying to do and how it may limit and affect us in the future as drone flyers in the United States. My purpose here today is to remind you to leave a comment on the docket of the federalregister.gov website for this notice of proposed rulemaking. Uh, make sure that you get your voice heard as well. A lot of us procrastinated when we watched those first couple videos. We said, oh, we'll do it next week or I'll do it next month. Well, there is no next week, folks. We only have until March 2nd. 2020 to get our comments in, to be heard, to let them know what we feel about this notice of proposed rulemaking and how it's going to affect the hobby that we love. Now let's talk about this notice of proposed rulemaking. It's remote ID for UAS, and that includes drones, that includes FPV quads, that includes um, you know model aircraft of any sort. And what the AFA wants us as pilots to be able to do is to constantly broadcast or transmit our uh, location as a remote pilot, but also uh, the altitude, the longitude, the latitude, the aircraft ID of what's up in the sky so that you know law enforcement or whoever has some authority can track us down if they need to. They can find out who's flying at any given point in time. And um, they do that uh, for m multiple reasons, perhaps. Um, some may be commercial reasons for big business moving in with drones. Also, perhaps uh, safety issues, um, threat mitigation uh, in the public. But that's their end goal, is, is for all aircraft above 0.55 pounds in the United States to be remotely identified uh, using various ways of, of doing that. Um, now, you have different types of remote ID. You have your broadcast and you have your internet, which can be uh, accomplished via Wi-Fi. Broadcast is going to be the much more involved and potentially more expensive um, version, which would uh, be broadcasting outward in miles in every direction, but also broadcasting to your, uh, you know, your ground station. And that's something you'd probably see more in uh, professional applications of drones, like uh, movie making or agriculture or inspection, where they have a little bit deeper pockets than just the hobbyist. Uh, and then you go to the other one, which is internet or Wi-Fi, where the drone itself is only being uh, talking with the, the ground station or the remote pilot. And then the remote pilot is connected to the internet via a hotspot or something like that in order to be able to use that transmission service for remote ID. So both are going to have to utilize services, um, even the limited, where it's Wi-Fi based to the uh, ground station with the control, you're still gonna have to somehow be connected to the internet. So that's going to be a monthly fee for data plan, but also a potential small fee just to utilize that service because we are paying for these services in order to actually access them. Now you have three tiers for compliance. You have your standard, your limited, and none or non-compliant. So with standard, that's going to be your broadcasting uh, component of your remote ID method. So uh, for those higher end drones or the people who are able to um, fit out their drones and, and UAS with these particular broadcast remote ID components, they can fit into that. And so if you're part 107 and you have a uh, standard uh, compliant drone, you actually can do a lot more than you can now. And that's kind of interesting. So if you are part 107 in the United States and you're doing this professionally, um, then you actually have a little more freedom than you do now um, in regards to flying beyond line of sight, uh, flying over people, flying at night. A lot of these things that required waivers may not actually be quite so strict uh, in the future if this passes the way it is. But because the vast majority of hobbyists will only fit into that limited uh, scope of uh, tier of remote ID compliance, that means the exact opposite. We are much more limited to what we can do. The biggest uh, problem here, the biggest concern, is that we'll be limited to 400 feet. Now, right now we're 400 feet up limited legally. You can only fly up to 400 feet AGL. 
But now with limited remote ID, the way it's worded, we can only fly 400 feet in any direction, so horizontally. So only 400 feet radius, which means, uh, you know, if a police officer wants to find out who's flying that drone, he only has to look within 400 feet of the drone, you know, supposedly, in order to uh, actually find out who's flying that drone. So 400 feet radius, that's going to limit us a lot. Um, and even if you can outfit a FPV quad somehow with a transponder or a, a transmitter in order to satisfy limited remote ID, these things go so fast, and I've, you know, it's, it's FPV freestyle or racing. It's like you can eat up 400 feet real fast. Um, but even uh, with DJI equipment or Alltel equipment, you're trying to fly um, around an environment, even out in nature where there's nothing around you, should be no problem. You still would have to have that limited remote ID compliance and not fly 400 feet away from you. So um, some of those nice waterfall or bridge shots, you can kind of uh, kiss those goodbye, I suppose. Uh, then you have no compliance, non-compliance. So you're, you have a, a like a model aircraft, an FPV quad that you built yourself, some of these different drones that cannot be retrofitted uh, with some of those uh, limited compliant features. Then that means that you are non-compliant and you have to be restricted to, and let's see what they call them, FAA recognized identification areas or FRIAs, which uh, we assume are going to be like AMA fields and stuff like that. So that's like a flat area, a field, and you can fly there without remote ID and transmitting. But that's pretty boring, <laughs> especially for like FPV quads and stuff like that. The other problem with FRIAs, the FAA recognized uh, identification areas, uh, once, if this passes, I say once, I say, I hope if this passes the way it is, then there will only be 12 months, uh, a 12 month period where um, these sites can sign up to become these, you know, recognized identification areas. And then once that 12-month window closes, there's no more application period. No more can be applied for, which means that after 12 months, you know, as these fields may close down over the years, there will be no more, and there will be a constantly shrinking number of FRIAs in the country. Um, so that's going to limit things even more. Now, for people who say, oh, I can make my home-built quad or my model aircraft I built or my FPV quad um, with, uh, you know, components and I can, I can fit in a transmitter, I can make that work. Well, the problem with that is the FAA wants to be able to sign off on anything that it's going to be up in the air under limited uh, compliance. So if you have a bunch of quads, like I have these, which are just a mishmash of parts, you know, I, mean, I order them, they work together, I upgrade this part, I upgrade that part. It's a constantly evolving uh, piece of machinery. It will never be compliant because the FAA needs to sign off on this. So, you know, you actually have to have like a certificate of authorization just to get onto the FAA database in order to use that limited compliance or limited remote ID service. So, as much as I would want to have this working, uh, you know, as a limited uh, compliant quad, at least fly 400 feet around me, in in you know other unrestricted areas. It will never happen. Second, 100% of the components of something in the sky has to be from an FAA approved manufacturer signed off by the FAA. So unless you can prove it, um, this is a non-compliant device. This quad can be bound to this radio just fine. Well, it can also be bound to this one. And in fact, if I want to switch back and forth, that's, you know, I can do that right now. Well, how about this? I have this radio. And I have two quads. I'm gonna bind them both to this radio because I just wanna make it simple on myself. Take one radio out and a bunch of quads. Well, that's what exactly what the FA does not want us to do. They want to be able to remotely identify the pilot with the aircraft and make sure that that is actually something consistent. So if you have multiple quads bound to one radio or multiple quads bound to multiple radios or quads that can be bindable to multiple radios, then they can no longer bet on that. And so that's gonna be one of those requirements for limited remote ID is to have something that can only be bound to one radio. So if you think of like a, a Mavic Pro or a Phantom 4 Pro or something, the controller is bought with the drone and it's a, it's a, it's a pairing. Not like this type of stuff. 
So that's really worrisome for someone like me who has a ton of these different drones and, and, and different radios. Another thing is for limited compliance with this uh, ruling, you would have to uh, have some sort of software function so that it would actually limit you on takeoff or limit you from going more than 400 feet away from you. It's not just like, okay, he's, he's beyond 400 feet, so you know he's just hoping for the best and he's hoping not to get caught. No, they want software and limitations in this machinery in order for you to not even be able to take off in the first place if you're not connected to the internet, or to not be able to fly beyond 400 feet if uh, you know you try, it's gonna like block you. It's like some of these DJI geofencing areas, only much more restricted. So the expectation is that DJI drones are gonna be able to maybe get through this, maybe with a software update, but manufacturers in the United States have up to two years after this might become, uh, you know, actually official ruling to start churning out compliant products. Now there's a three year window from when this becomes official ruling where everything has to be compliant. So we have three years from possibly the end of the year, which is maybe when this might actually be decided upon, uh, to where things actually have to be completely changed. But within two years, US manufacturers have to get their act together and start churning out only compliant products. So um, yeah, I mean, like I said, I've, at the beginning of this video, I've been flying a little over three years. So I have roughly that amount of time again uh, ahead of me. So I'm, I'm middle-aged <laughs> drone-wise, but um, I'm really hoping that that doesn't actually become the case and that you know, somehow we can find a, a compromise with these, with these uh, it's proposed rulemaking the way it is. And that's why comments are necessary to submit your own comments um, or you know at least go off some of the outlines other people have provided. Now there are questions that are brought up. What if you have a limited compliant device but you're out in the middle of nowhere and you have no cell phone signal in order to fly? Um, will you be able to fly? You know, will you be able to fly without constantly transmitting like that? Um, the way it seems to sound right now is no, because these drones are going to be programmed via software to prevent you from taking off if you can't be transmitting your remote ID over to these you know, FA databases and systems. So you could be out in the middle of nowhere and still not be able to fly. Uh, that's concerning. Also, what if you have a remote ID uh, limited compliant device and you go to a FREA field, do you still have to stay within 400 feet of yourself? Is the software still going to kick in or will it know that you're in a FREA location? How much will this cost per month? Do you have to do it for every single drone? If I have five drones, do I have to pay the, the fee you know, five times? There's so many questions. Um, and so it's really hard to know exactly, but what I don't want to have happen and what a lot of us don't want to have happen is that the worst case scenario happens. Let's not have that happen. So comments. DJI has put out some uh, responses to this. I mean, they were even actually for remote ID, but even they think this is too strict. So you read up on what they think and there's a video, there's a, in the video description, there's a, a link to what they think. And then also like um, the FPV Freedom Coalition, uh, Rotor Riot has a lot of uh, good thoughts for maybe some ideas about how to get around this or a compromise. Because we understand, okay, the FA, it's coming down on us. But how far it comes down is kind of up to us and, and what we say in the comments and how much um, we, we put forth in our efforts to fight this and to at least show that we're not going to go down without a fight. Um, and another way that we could do that is through peaceful protests. And so on the 28th and 29th of February, there's going to be a protest in Washington, D.C. in front of the FAA headquarters. Now, I'm not going to actually attend. I have some obligations that I signed up for many months ago, and I cannot get out of them, and I'm very disappointed. But the least I can do is tell you about it. Um, so again, video description, there are links to both the talking points and the outline for making a comment to the FAA, but also links to information about that protest, um, just to show, again, that we are of one voice. One thing that you can't do is curse them out, chew them out. You know, there, 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 there's ways to go about this that are professional, and if you start just like vomiting onto your keyboard, it's not gonna go over well, and your comment may not be taken seriously. Um, the good thing is, though, the FA is required to take all comments into account. So that's where you come in. So how do you submit a comment? Video description, 
I have a link to it. Uh, it's docket uh, FAA-2019-1100. On the top right, it says submit a formal comment. So I'm hoping that we can get a lot more people in these last few days uh, to submit. And that's the whole point of my video is to remind you. Now, one of the big problems I have with this, uh, you know, remote ID system here, proposal, if you're flying a drone and it's non-compliant, though they can't track you at that point, they don't know who that is. Well, if I wanted to do something nefarious with the drone and I'm not giving anybody ideas, I won't be signing up for remote ID. You know, I won't be using a limited aircraft like that. I'll be using something more than likely home built. Remote ID is not going to catch the bad guys. It's only going to hurt the good guys or the people who are law abiding citizens like us. It's not going to change anything for anybody else. Thanks so much for watching. Um, I hope the hobby is as important to you as it is to me. And even if you don't personally find the value in the hobby in your own life, then hopefully you can at least understand and, and uh, recognize that Drones have been a big part of learning in schools. Drones have done so much good for innovation and creativity, community building and relationships. Um, you know, the learning of the, the children as they get their first drone or going to, into school where there's drone programs for kids to learn how to build these things and, and program them and operate them and eventually go on to their own engineering and aeronautical careers of their own. Um, it'd be a shame to see something so heavy-handed as this proposed rulemaking uh, to stifle some of that in, in, our, in our communities, in our country. Uh, I just think that would be quite the shame. So anyway, it's not all about me and, and how much fun I have on a weekend. It's about the bigger picture too. So thank you so much for watching everybody. Again, check the video description for information about this stuff and for a, a way to submit your formal comment. And until next time, and hopefully for a very long time, happy flying.